You are listening to the weekly podcast. One hour late. Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Weekly Darts Cast in association with Darts Corner. I'm Alex Moss and joining me as always, my co-host, he is the Darts Statistician, still the Darts Driver King, Burton DeWitt. How are you doing? I'm doing excellent. How are you, Alex? Glad to hear it. Yeah, I'm doing well. I've just uh, ventured out to Blackpool at the weekend, walked past the Winter Garden, so not long to go until the World Match play. Two players who are going to be amongst the contenders for that Phil Taylor trophy we know already, Rob Cross and Luke Humphreys, and those two serving up a, a thriller in the final of the Baltic Sea Darts Open on Sunday night. And we've got ourselves a Rob Cross appreciation minute. Rob Cross beating Luke Humphreys to win the title. Despite his disappointing Premier League return this year, how highly do you rate Rob's chances of landing more major success this year? Perhaps a second match play title on the cards? Well, I said to you before we started recording that I was going to take issue with this question on two different grounds. One of them is pretty obvious. It requires me to acknowledge the Premier League, uh, which I've tried not to do all year. But the second and bigger issue is that it's going to require me to discuss the Premier League because I don't think I agree with the question. I do not think it's been a disappointing Premier League for Rob Cross. Uh, while you know he's down in sixth place, he's been eliminated, and it might be a disappointing placement and a disappointing result at the end of the day for him. I think overall he has played at a very, very good standard. He's fifth in averages so far this year in the Premier League. He's second in checkout percentage. And if you look at the 15 matches he's lost, because he hasn't won a day yet, so he's lost or not yet, he's lost on all 15 of them. Here are the average which is rounded to the here, nearest high number of the players in those 15 matches that beat him. 102, 104, 99, 99, 95, 114, 103, 101, 94, 100, 98, 99, sorry, 98, 98, 105, 102, 109. Nine of the 15 over a ton, all but one over 95. And 12 of those 15 were uh, matches where his opponent beat their seasonal Premier League average. So 80% of the time, he's ran into someone who was outperforming their normal average. And that's why he's gone out early. It's not that Rob Cross hasn't played well. It's that almost without exception, his opponents have outperformed their norm. And even when they didn't, like uh, it was because Goran Price averaged 97.87, less than a point below his season average. Uh, you know, it's something like that. The lowest average he's faced all year was actually was the 93.75 by Peter Wright. And even that was above Peter Wright's seasonal average. Um, it's been almost unfair, the level of bad luck that Rob Cross has gotten the, so far this year in the Premier League. And that's why he's going out. It's not because he's been disappointing. It's not because he hasn't been playing among the best darts of anyone in the world. It's just been that his timing hasn't been there. But it was there this past weekend. And it's been there a lot this year on the Euro Tour. You know, three semifinals are better this year to go along uh, with the final in the very first event. Now he's capped it off with a... Um, victory over a Luke Humphreys who was playing well, Luke Humphreys who threw a nine dart leg to go five, three up and three away from the title through one Oh four in that, but it wasn't enough to deny the now 18 hit wonder Rob Cross. And over the course of the week, Rob Cross was a weekend. I should say was the best player. You know, he was absolutely brilliant in his first two matches. He regressed against Richie Edhouse and he was lucky to get through that match. Edhouse was not on his best, but Edhouse, had the timing and nearly uh, nipped Cross, missed that dart at tops, just the wrong side of the wire. And Cross came back from 5-3 down to win that 6-5. But Rob Cross played well in that, averaged nearly 98. He then averaged 99 in the semis and, as I mentioned, 105 and a half in the final. Rob Cross was the best player this past weekend. And there's a good argument that he's been the best player in the Premier League who isn't going to the playoffs. Even better, one could say, than Gurren Price because of just how – much bad luck Rob Cross has gotten. But how close is he to winning another major? I think you have to say pretty close. You know, semifinal at the World Championship, a deep run in Minehead. Um, back end of last year made the final, the Grand Slam of darts. He's been playing at a very, very high level on the big stage all year um, and getting results. And he's got to be considered one of the favorites. Will it come in uh, Blackpool? I don't know. You know, there's so many players right now who are playing good enough and who are hungry to get that title. But 
Rob Cross is one of the five or six best players in the world right now. And we'll come back to that in the very last question. But I rate him as being one of the favorites. Maybe not that first level, not that Luke Humphreys, Luke Littler level, but that second level. And someone from that second level, if not multiple people, are going to win majors this year. Why not Rob Cross? He's been brilliant, even if the Premier League table um, incorrectly suggests otherwise. Yeah, I've got to say, we, we love ourselves a, a Rob Cross appreciation minute, don't we? Great to get it back on the show this week. And Rob Cross, uh, as you say there, he's, he's been playing well for quite some time, maybe not had the rewards that his performances have deserved. But looking at the stats, Darts Oracle, our, our friends over there, the last 12 months, Rob Cross, his average, 97.04, fifth on that list. And you just go on the last six months, still fifth in the averages. And even since the World Championships, fifth on the averages, it shows you and all those averages in, in the 97 range. So he's been consistent for a while now. And at the weekend, his tournament average over the ton mark across those five matches over two days. And, and in particular, that final day of a, a Euro Tour event when you're playing four matches, that's not an easy thing to do to keep that form going. But he, he did. And as you say, he had a, a little bit of luck against Richie Edouse in the quarterfinals, surviving a match start. Came through a, a last leg decider against Stephen Bunting in the, the last 16 as well. But after those two games, just seemed to kick on from there. Almost 50% on the doubles across those next two games. The semis in the final, the 180s were flying. He had four against Madders Rasma, then five against Luke Humphreys in the final. And the final itself, five free down. You've just seen your opponent throw that nine data. To come back and win five of the next six legs, he had that 11 data to break, a 15 data on throw another 12 data to break and then a, a 12 dart to hold those 12 darters. The last two legs from six all didn't give Luke Humphreys a, a shot, a, a, not, let alone a double a, a finish in those last two legs. And I think in those last six legs or so, he had four 180s or 171, really did seem to go through the gears when he needed to at just the right time. And that timing is a, a sign of a player in good form and in a good place with their game at the moment. And there was a, a few times as well, I noticed he... He's trusted double 18, he'd go inside, but he had the confidence to burn a dart, go single 10, double four. So instead of having those two darts at double nine, you're banking on hitting double four with one dart. And players aren't going to do that unless they're feeling confident about their game. But 105 average in the final to beat the world number one, Luke Humphreys, who himself averaged 104, hit that nine dart. It's a, a big feather in the cap for Rob Cross and... Don't forget, only a few months ago, he was averaging 108 in another Euro Tour final, lost that 187 to Luke Littler. And as for the Premier League, we'll talk about it more later. But for Rob Cross, back in that lineup this year for the first time since 2021, currently in sixth spot, it's probably where he's going to finish. I think if Price wins the night, there's potential he could drop to that seventh. But he was in that top four early on in the season after six weeks, went on that run of six weeks, losing in the first game. And that really did set him back and he has made back-to-back -back finals in recent weeks, ended that run, but it was all uh, too little too late for him. But the good thing for Rob Cross, there's going to be plenty more opportunities on the horizon. He's got the match play coming up, all the other majors he's going to be in in that second half of the season. And yeah, if he can keep this form and momentum going, then he's going to have a say and on who's going to lift that major silverware. So if you're counting the World Championships as the start of a, a calendar year, then he's been in a major final every calendar year since coming on the tour. So you would expect him to be in the final knock-ins of at least one, maybe two of these majors for going into the rest of the year. And again, he's shown it at the weekend. He's a classy operator on the hockey. And for that reason, yeah, I, I agree. I think he is going to be in that conversation for the majors beyond the Premier League for the rest of this year. Well, you mentioned we're coming on the second half of the year. We're not quite there yet. We're only six of the 13 events into the Euro Tour calendar for season 2024. Uh, but which players have impressed you the most so far on the greatest tour in professional sports? A disappointing and, and rather short outing in Kiel at the weekend for him. But I've got to start with the man who is top of the pile when it comes to titles won so far on the Euro Tour this year. And that is Luke Littler. 15 games played, 13 won, two lost and... In 13 of those 15 games, he's averaged 95 plus. The two outliers, the 91 average against Soren Lurchbacker in the first round in Graz, which he won and then went on to win the title. And then the Friday just gone, the 83 average, 6 3 defeat to his old development tour nemesis, West Nyman. But aside from those two, it's been such an impressive level of consistency from Luke Littler. And 
okay, he said this past weekend, the lack of sleep caught up with him. He's been playing Premier League, then having to play on the Friday in the Euro Tour. But before then, he'd he very rarely shown signs of fatigue. And I, I mentioned those four games on finals day in these Euro Tours. His first ever one in Belgium, experiencing those four games on stage. What does he do? 101, 110, 104, 103 averages, nine data in the final, beats Rob Cross in a decider, wins the title. And it was the same in Graz as well a, a few weeks ago, 95, 98, 105. 102 to win his second title and that green jacket and yeah it's, it's been an impressive first season already for the the nuke on the euro tour with those two titles and i've got to mention the other title winners as well luke Humphreys, probably the standout individual performance we've seen so far that 112 average uh, an 8-1 demolition of, of michael van Gogh in that final in munich we've already spoken about rob cross's win at the weekend we'll give him another mention there Gary Anson, you could say he's completed the Euro Tour. He won that title in single thing and then he's withdrawn from the next two Euro Tours. He's taken a bit of time off and Martin Schindler, the other winner, a first PDC title for him. And when he won the title and uh, along with Rob Cross, the, the most match wins so far this season, they've both won 14 games each and Martin Schindler picked up a, a lot of scalps as well. You look at that list of players that he's beaten that are above him in the rankings, Damon Hetter, Chris Dobie, Nathan Aspinall, Joe Cullen, uh, Danny Knopper, Chris Doby again, go in price in that final of that Euro Tour. Johnny Clay and James Wade, and in all but one of them, he's averaged 95 or above. He had that 111 to beat James Wade, a 108 to beat another rising star who I didn't mention, Gian Van Veen, and he's even lost to Rock Cross with a, a 106. And two other names I'll just mention briefly. They've not won a title, but Jermaine Watamina, I know he's someone you've mentioned a few times recently, started off the year back to back quarterfinals and before this year, he'd made one quarter final on the Euro Tour and again, beaten a, a list of top 16 players during those two rounds. And lastly, we've had a Rob Cross appreciation minute. We'll have a Richie Edhouse appreciation 30 seconds because before this year, he'd never thrown a 100 plus average on the Euro Tour. He's done that five times this year already. 106 average, he broke his record at the weekend, beating Nathan Aspinall in the first round. And it's put him in touching distance of a, a debut at the World Match Play. He can almost taste that Blackpool B&B breakfast and it's going to taste all the better given the form the performances that he's been putting in on a, a regular basis on the Euro Tour on that stage this year yeah you said a lot of people I was going to say because they're the right answers and not you know you the last person you had was the first person on my list the first person you had was the second person on my list and the second to last person you had to the third person on my list so so some of this will be repetitive but I think it's worth discussing all three of them and i'll start with richie edhouse and okay i lied it's not worth discussing it's just worth mentioning there's nothing more we can say about uh richie edhouse i mean darts oracle uh this morning as of uh the time of recording a couple days ago by the time you're listening uh sent out the tweet that he is held throw in 82 of his last hundred legs more than anyone else in the world and at least in the pdc darts i mean that's a phenomenal uh, hold rate you think two-thirds of the time is I think about what the Pro Tour average is. He's exceeded that by 15 legs in of 100. Um, just almost impossible to break him. And that's because he's playing at such a high level and his timing and his finishing have been nearly flawless. You know, yes, he'll occasionally miss six, seven darts to win a leg, but that's about it. If there's, Other than that, if he's not missing six or seven, he's not missing any and he's winning the leg. Absolutely phenomenal player. Um, and that's why he's going to be at pretty much every televised event, except maybe the Grand Slam this year. Um, the first person you mentioned, I'll just mention quickly, Luke Littler. We've talked about him a lot. We deserve to talk about him a lot. <laughs> Boy, has he been brilliant. And he's answered every question we've had, or at least I've raised, about how, what's he going to do this year. Um, he's a phenomenal talent, and his head's in the right place. Um, he has two titles from the first six Kind of expect him to get two from the last seven. Um, and then you also mentioned Jermaine Watamena. And I was also going to say that, you know, he's only had one previous quarterfinal before the first two events this year. You know, one quarterfinal from 47 Euro Tours that he qualified for over the space of nearly a decade. And it wasn't just that he had not made the quarterfinals. He had barely won a match on the Euro Tour before those two quarterfinals. In his last 19 matches on the Euro Tour, he had won three of them dating back to the last event in 2019. Those three matches, his opponents had averages of 78, 80, and 82. He had not won a match in over four years against someone who averaged higher than 82 in that match. So 
he had not won a match against anyone who played better than what would be a normal C or D game on the European tour in over four years. And he gets out of that by making a pair of quarterfinals. He's only qualified for one of the ones since then and went out a second match. But boy, is it a turnaround in European tour form after an extended period of time where he could do nothing on the European tour. Uh, is part of an overall really uh, return to form for Watamina. Still not as consistent as he was five, six years ago when he was in the seeds for the Euro Tour and in qualifying for everything, but he's playing a lot better and a lot closer to that consistency. I think it's just a matter of time before he's really showing himself back in that race for some of these big televised events. And I'll quickly mention three other people. Martin Schindler, uh, yeah, he won the title, but he also had a semifinal and a quarterfinal to go with that. Stephen Bunting as well, three quarters or better, two semifinals and a quarterfinal, and has looked be, to be that player who is on the verge of winning a Euro Tour pretty much each of those runs. It just hasn't happened yet, but he looks a winner, even if he hasn't won. And finally, Ross Smith, kind of like Watamina, not that much success previously on the European tour, only four quarterfinals. Granted, that's four times as many as Watamina before this year, but he's already had three this year, including a trip to his first final. Another one of those players who looks a champion in the making. Grant, he is a European champion, but he's never won on the European tour. Someone, though, Rob Cross, had also managed to do that. And now move on to our first guest on this week's show. He is the Sky Sports commentator, Rod Studd. I'm pleased to say I'm joined by the Sky Sports commentator, Rod Studd. Thanks for the time again, Rod. How are you doing? Oh, absolutely fine. Good to speak to you, Alex. Yeah, it's always a pleasure to be asked to come on one of the darts podcasts. <laughs> Well, we'll come back to that later on. One of the boxing podcasts. Okay. Well, we, we might be asking you your prediction on the, the big fight this weekend later, so stay tuned for that. But we are talking just a, a few days before the Premier League darts league phase reaches its conclusion in Sheffield. We've got Luke Littler, Luke Humphreys, Michael Van Gerwen already confirmed for the playoffs. But what have you made of this season's offering so far? I really enjoyed it. I think it's been great. I think it's been great. Obviously... Luke Littler coming in has blown a breath of fresh air through the competition and given it another dimension. But I think the whole thing's been interesting. You know, we've seen uh, a number of players have a good burst of form. You know, Van Gerwen at the start, then Humphreys, then Littler. And all that after Michael Smith won the first event and then kind of disappeared off the radar a bit and then rallied towards the end. And we've still got, due to the way the format is uh, pre-planned, fourth be fifth on the last round of matches in Sheffield. And that's designed to give us that playoff for the playoffs that it did last year with Aspinall was involved and and Clayton. And this time it's going to be Smith versus Aspinall really playing off for the playoffs, isn't it? So it's worked really well, I think, the first 16 weeks. I'm sure we'll have a great finals night at the O2. Yeah, you mentioned it there. One spot in the playoffs left to be decided. That straight shootout between Nathan Aspinall and, and Michael Smith. One point between them in the table. So that quarter final clash on Thursday is for that spot in the playoffs. And to quote you, who's got the momentum going into this huge matchup? <laughs> well, that's a good question, that, actually, because you'd probably argue Smith, wouldn't you, because he beat Aspinall in Leeds last week. But that was a funny game, because if you just looked at the stats without the leg score, you probably thought that Aspinall had won it. His average was considerably better than Smith's on the night. He's also arguably had been played better than Smith. He's above him in the table, or has been above him in the table for much of the year. So... It's an interesting one. I mean, I know a lot of guys that build data models with all the data averages, you know, how many legs are finished inside 18, 15 and 12 darts and so on, finishing stats. And they make Aspinall favourite for this match. So momentum or no momentum, they reckon Aspinall is slightly more likely to win it. I'm not sure. I think it's a very close affair and it'll come down as a lot of darts matches. Two hits, who hits the doubles at the right time and what happens when you miss a double? Does your opponent punish you or do you get away with it? So I think it'll be a knife edge game and one that'll be well worth watching. Yeah, we're looking forward to it, and we'll come back to this year's Premier League a little bit later on, but let's rewind the last time we had you on the show with Burton and I, just before the playoffs last year, which Michael Van Gerwen won, and it would be his only big success in front of the Sky Sports cameras in 2023. It was all eyes on Ali Pally in December for the Worlds, and we've got to talk about Luke Littley. You were on commentary for his second round game of Andrew Gildon, still early on in that tournament, but when did you get a sense that Luke could do something special in that event? Well, I was a bit late on the bandwagon, I think I have to say, and I was probably almost not on the bandwagon at all. 
to be honest. I mean, people were going berserk when it, when it started off when he beat uh, Christian Kiss, weren't they? And I thought, well, hang on a bit. I mean, let, let's not get carried away with one match. And then, and then Gilding had him in, in some kind of trouble. And there were a couple of sets early on in the piece there where Littler didn't play that well. I thought, well, maybe he's going back to a bit of a regression to the mean here. And is he going to start producing the fireworks? Which he did, of course. And I think the, the game which really made a lot of people to so take notice was the Barnabell match. But even after that, I mean, I thought that, you know, Cross was being underrated uh, by bookmakers when he played in the semi-final because they made Littler a slight favourite and I couldn't have that at all. I thought, well, maybe this is the time where Cross, a man of vast experience and great talent and already having won the World Championship, might take him to school a little bit. And indeed, after a set, Cross was then the favourite and it seemed like maybe that was what was going to happen. But then Littler completely exploded, didn't he? And really turned it on and in the end was a very, very good winner against Cross. Took him to the cleaners, really. And uh, and then it was down to Humphreys. Could he beat Humphreys? Well, on the night, he couldn't. But it was a closely contested game, and it could have gone either way. And Humphreys was just the better player, but there wasn't much in it, was there? And since then, he's got an outstanding record against Humphreys, hasn't he? Particularly in the Premier League. So you'd struggle to say it was a flash in the plat in the pan. I'm I'm not sure. I, I think maybe there's a bit of an still an overrating going on. And I go back to the guys who do the models. They still make Humphreys clearly the best player and reckon that in most betting markets Littler is being overestimated and usually the value is to back against Littler he doesn't win every match let's get that right but the World Championship was terrific and he's, and he's carried on maybe not quite at that level but certainly very close to it and uh, Wayne and I have something called Mad Rank which is an alternative world ranking and it constitutes simply on a Thursday night over a couple of beers writing down the back of a beer map the top ten and I think at the moment we'd have Humphreys top and um, Littler second. So I think he's a good second in, in MAB ranking behind Humphreys, although the world ranking will take many, many months to catch up, won't they? I looked at it the other day and he's still down in the 20-somethings, isn't he? I mean, I'll tell you what, Alex, there's a challenge for you. Get, get people to write 20 players that they think are better than Luke Littler and good luck with that project. So I, I think I think we know the world rankings is a two-year cycle, so it does take time to catch up. And it, it will catch up eventually, but I think it's fair to say at the moment, I make Littler second behind Humphreys, which we saw in the World Championship, and, and maybe we'll see that in the Premier League as well. Maybe it will be a repeat of the World Final in the Premier League final. Perfectly possible. We shall see. Well, uh, another player, he might not be in the current top 10 of the, the MAB rankings but after the win that he had at the World Championship he, he might have been that night and that is the player that you called the darting Eric Cantona, Scott Williams knocking out Michael Van Gerwen in the quarterfinals and we've seen some yeah. surprise results at Ali Pali in the latter stages before, one or two involving Kirk Shepard but where does Scott's win rank on that list for you? You, you, you seem to mention uh, the darting Voldemort there, <laughs> Kirk Shepard sorry I nearly said it, uh, he who must not be named Sorry, what was the question, Alex? I heard, I heard the name of the darting Voldemort and it sent a shiver through my spine. What was the question again, sorry? It does for a few people. I was going to ask you, where do you think Scott Williams' uh, win against MVG ranks on that list of surprise results that we've seen in the uh, world? Well, well, it was a big surprise. It was a big surprise, particularly with Van Gerwen going off like a house on fire at the start of the match. But I think maybe the case where Van Gerwen imploded, inexplicably imploded after the first set when he was averaging well over 100 and then he threw a couple of sets when he was averaging in the low 80s and it was awful really and you know I don't think Williams caught fire himself but just by his very persona he, he lights up the arena doesn't he, the way he swaggers around the stage, collar up, I mean I like I mean we both came to the conclusion didn't we you did too that he was the darting Eric Cantona and he is reminiscent of the great French uh, footballer you know, just a very uh, confidence bordering on arrogance so I say bordering on arrogance yeah, I don't think he oversteps the mark on the stage at all so I mean I, I enjoy watching him play and, he, and he's great fun to watch and he deserved the win um, you know I don't think it wouldn't be I don't think quite on a par with the Voldemort against Mardell game would it but <laughs> but it was certainly a big upset and Van Gerwen we shouldn't forget went into the quarterfinals of the world championship as the favourite to win the tournament lost in the very next round so I think he was 6-4 to four with bookmakers going into the quarterfinals and now he'll go into the finals night at uh, the O2 Arena in the Premier League he's the third favourite behind Humphreys and Littler so his his um, his stock has fallen Van Gerwen without a doubt since that game against uh, 
Scott Williams and, and since in the Premier League. And that's curious to say because he started so well in the Premier League and he's declined, hasn't he, without a doubt. And he's finishing it, you know, spluttering and stuttering a little bit in terms of his, uh, his averages. I mean, he won another nightly round, didn't he? He's won four. So he's done extremely well overall. But I just feel that he's not playing anything like MBG that we saw, say, in 2016-17, which was completely peerless. Well, we also saw during the World Championship, you referred to us as one of the darts podcasts, so an unofficial shout out on Sky. But we have a, a joke going now on Twitter between us. If we ever post something non darts related, you've called us one of the American rapper podcasts. We've called you one of the two Ronnie's <laughs> impressionists. What's been your favourite one so far? Well, I think sometimes Alex, it's the original, is the best, isn't it? And I think one of the one of the boxing podcasts <laughs> which started it all was probably the funniest. You know, and I know we both tried to compete with each other to find something more ridiculous. And perhaps we have, but I, I heart back to that. I, one of the boxing podcasts, and the way that you sort of uh, took the mickey out of yourselves was, was quite well, quite lovely, I thought, quite heartwarming. And, and I've enjoyed, you know, the uh, verbal or the Twitter ping pong back and forth as we try to win the rally, as it were. But it, it could run and run, couldn't it? Yeah, it's been a, a good laugh and it's great to get one of the darts commentators yourself on the show this week and also Tyson Fury as well to, to get our boxing uh, bit in there. But let's get back to the darts and the, the Premier League nearing its conclusion. We've noticed the media interest in darts has grown since the world. So I was at the Manchester night and I don't get to many events, but it's the busiest I've seen the press room for a, a Premier League night. As someone who's been in that press room backstage for a while, can you put a scale on how much that media attention on darts has grown? Oh, enormously. I was speaking to Dave Allen, who, as you know, is the, uh, the PDC's media guru who organises everything and keeps everyone under control in, in the press rooms for the PDC. And he was saying that for the finals night at the O2, it'll be the busiest he's ever seen. And they're having to put an extra press room on because they can't fit everybody in the normal press room at the O2 arena. But I mean, we saw all the world championship and it was all driven by Littler, obviously. And... Um, you know, I remember walking back into the press room and after each match, as you know, the, the winning players and sometimes the losing players, if it's, a, if it's a high profile player or it's a big match semi-final, say, we'll do a press conference. And I walk back into the room and normally you can see them chatting away, whoever it is, Gary Anderson, you know, Michael Van Gerwen, whoever it may be, even back a few years ago, Phil Taylor. And this time I walked back in the room and I couldn't see who was doing the actual press conference because <laughs> the crowd round it, him, whoever he was, was so much I couldn't see it was like trying to see something through a forest of trees I thought what's going on here so I sort of tiptoed round to find out what was going on without trying to make a scene peered round this you know crowd of journalists and, and behind them all was this little 16 year old kid Luke Littler that they, they couldn't get enough of I mean the attention I thought maybe Lionel Messi had walked in or something <laughs> you know but I mean it was extraordinary it was extraordinary I've never seen anything like it never with Taylor or Van Gerwen at his peak or any of the big hitters Anderson, Barnevelt whoever you want to name never seen anything like it and that just got that was not that wasn't one of the latter rounds that was probably maybe last 16 quarter final time and of course he got bigger and bigger and bigger the more he, he marched on in the tournament it's been incredible something that I've, I've never seen in darts in the in, in the decades I've been covering it you know, as I say, and that includes you know dealing with players like Taylor and Van Gerwen and Barnabel and the greatest players having to throw a dart. You know, this kid has created an interest that was completely unheard of and unseen before. Well, you mentioned Raymond Van Barneveld. I was going to come on to him in, in the next question because you posted on Twitter during the season you were back in Rotterdam to commentate on that night, the first time that you'd been there since 2019 and that infamous Barney retirement yeah. interview, then unretiring. You were the man asking the questions in that interview for Sky. Is that the one that sticks out as the most memorable from the darts interviews you've done? Obviously, Jerry Hendricks being a fish on stage is up there as well, right? Oh, that was brilliant. I, I, yeah, I... Yeah, I, I knew what he meant. I think I think most people knew what he meant. He, ju he just kind of like tried to use an English analogy, and being Dutch, it didn't quite work. But I knew what he meant. He meant that he took to it like a fish to water, didn't he? A duck to water, if we would say. And he probably thought fish to water, and then then got fish and stage mixed up. Well, a fish wouldn't take very well to the stage. <laughs> but I remember uh, after that, that Rob Cross and this wasn't with me. He said he was a, he was throwing as free as a bird, and I wondered how a bird would get on against a fish at darts. <laughs> uh, that's the kind of sort of thing I do while watching a darts match. Would a bird beat a fish? Would free as a bird beat a fish on a stage? Um, the Barney one, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I remember it. I was just, I was in a state of confusion. Um, then 
was the woman he, he retired for the second time after he lost to Darren Young at the World Championship. And that was a that was an interviewing horror story because he, he clearly just didn't really want to do the interview, but felt he had to. But it was like a yes/no interlude. Whatever I asked him, he wasn't prepared. He just didn't want to give anything more than a yes or no. Yeah, and that 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 was that was awful. And, and then people might remember, and it's on YouTube somewhere. They can enjoy it again, or I could endure it again. When Phil Taylor had a pop of me in uh, Dublin, when he didn't like my line of questioning about Dave Chisel in the final and beat the World Championship fairly recently, and, and uh, the power took exception to that. Uh, but if people do watch that, and they think, oh, he's giving stood a bit of a hide in here. But in fairness, he did ask me up to the press room the next day and apologise unreservedly. So that was a nice conclusion to what was a very awkward interview. But you know, so I, I mean, there's been there's been a lot of interviews and there's been a lot of headlines made from those interviews. So you know, it's just been great fun. Well, sticking with the Premier League, it's been a, another difficult campaign for Peter Wright. He's come back many times before from tough spells on the hockey, but right now. I don't even think Wayne Mardle would fancy him for the fish. So do you see this being Snakey's <laughs> last Premier League or is, will he come again? Well, I, you know, I am one of the biggest admirers of Peter Wright. I think what he's done in the last stage of his career has been truly remarkable and, you know, something that we should all look at. I think, you know, that should be celebrated. You know, he, you know, if you go back 10 years, he was a journeyman player that was on the brink of giving up. He didn't give up. He got to the world final where he lost to Van Gerwen. And then after that, you know, He's won two world championships, avenging the defeat by, by Van Gerwen, beating Michael Smith in the great final, winning the match play, winning loads of other tournaments. And when he does put the darts away, he'll be able to say, that was the best I could do. And I think that's all that any player should be able to do at the end of the career. If he can finish off and say, that was as best as I could do and I rang every ounce of my ability out of myself, that's a success. And I think, you know, Peter will be able to say that. And I hope this isn't the end. But, you know, when I was in, um, in Leeds doing the game against Littler, I just thought it was... A, the whole experience was a bit sad because even the dance looked a bit flat going on and I got, got the feeling that Peter didn't really think he had much of a chance in the match even himself he didn't believe he could win and he, and he got Kane 6-1 but so I thought I thought watching that that you know maybe we are watching you know the beginning of the end of, uh, of, of Snakey's career and that would, that would make me sad but you know he has come again and maybe he will I wouldn't I wouldn't dismiss it completely I would never do that with any darts player but I think at the moment it does look like this is starting to become the beginning of the end and maybe that's... I mean, unless he produces some miracle at the World Championship, he can't be in the Premier League next year, can he? I know he's been making some noise about being in it again, but I can't, I, at the moment, I, I, just, I just can't see that for the life of me how he would get into that eight-man field in 2025 unless he you know, got to the World Final or won the World Final or won the match play. And at the moment, those things seem highly unlikely the way he's playing. So... Yeah, it, it makes me a bit sad to think this is the end. It could be the end for Peter Wright, but I fear it may be. Yeah, well, hopefully you can come back. And, and two more before we let you go. Lastly, on the Premier League, uh, apart from a, a few tickets that are available on resale, it looks like we're heading for a, a sellout next week at the O2 for finals night. I think that's a, a first for the PDC to sell out the O2. So how special is that atmosphere going to be for finals night? Well, I think it'll be terrific. I mean, and the, the four players that are going to be in it, it, sh- it should be a sparkling night. And as you mentioned, we already know it'll be... Humphreys and Littler, Van Gerwen and either Smith or Aspinall. And I, I think it'll be a very special night. I mean, there's all sorts of things that are possible. I mean, Luke Littler, as we're talking now, is, I think, 17 years and 114 days old. So at finals night, it'll be 17 years and 123 days old. And if he wins, that'll make him the youngest player ever to win the Premier League. Van Gerwen has the record at the moment. When he was a ripe old 24 when he won it in uh, 2013, um, and Van Gerwen though has got this amazing record at the O2 Arena I make it he played 16 playoff matches there and won 14 of them and won title after title there 13 14 no, no, 13 16 17 18 and 19 and 23 and you have to go right back to 2015 to the last time he lost there to Anderson in the final and to 14 where he lost to Barney in the final so his record there is second to none and I just wonder could Van Gerwen turn it on again there or we could see Humphreys, you know, add the Premier League to the World Championship. So there's a lot of things that are possible. And of course, let's not dismiss whoever gets through out of Aspinall and Smith because they can upset the apple cart. So I think it's a great finals quartet. And I think it'll be a terrific night in London as we crown the champion for 2024, whoever that may be. Yeah, we can't wait to see it. And lastly, before we let you go, we've talked about the darts. We've talked a little bit about 
the boxing let's get on to a, another sport the snooker because we saw that you and Wayne were back at the Crucible a, a few weeks ago was Wayne messaging any players about their idiotic tactics and did his phone go off <laughs> during play well I mean the funny thing was the infamous Mardell phone ring it goes something like this <clears throat> boing <laughs> happened as you know in the uh, game involving Hawkins and Selt from whatever year it was when it was horrifically embarrassing and I was I was the human embodiment you know that meme where Homer Simpson goes back into the head <laughs> that was me trying to sink into my chair to avoid being noticed while Mardell's phone boinged and flashed away anyway we were watching a game this year and that not I heard that noise very faintly and I, I thought oh my god he's gone he's done it again and he he perked up in his seat as well and it was someone else's phone like across the uh, across the theatre so someone else in the theatre I'm not sure if it was a tribute to Mardell <laughs> had the same ringtone and it kind of it went off but it was very faint so the players didn't hear it but we heard it alright but it was a great it was a great day and I love going to the Crucible I really hope that uh, Snooker stays there for many many years to come because it's a, it's a great trip and just as it is for the Darts the Alexandra Palace they're magical venues for great sport well, Rod, it's always great to get you on the show. Thanks very much for giving us some of your time and wish you all the best for what else is to come in 2024 as well. An absolute pleasure. It's always a pleasure to be on. Thanks for asking me. Thanks again to Rod for joining us now. Moving on, there's been plenty going on off the hockey in the last week. Luke Humphreys debuting a new walk-on song, took on Kevin Painter's I Predict a Riot, and Andrew Gilding signing a fan's arm that the fan is now going to get tattooed so two questions for you Burton would you ever use someone else's walk on song and also would you ever get a darts related tattoo well stealing seems to be a Premier League thing you know Nathan Aspinall of course um, stole Dean Wynn Stanley's walk on song Gurren Price stole Alan Warner Little's nickname so it, it's only fair that Luke Humphreys has stolen an, another uh, former top player another former world finalist uh walk on song especially now that that player is off the tour but would i do it no because i have my walk on song and if some player steals my walk on song it's already my walk on song so i'm not stealing it from them they stole it from me i'm just keeping hold on it of course my walk on song i think i've mentioned it a few times on the show is it's the end of the world as we know it and i feel fine by rem any other player is fine to take it. I'll, I'll send them the bill for the royalties. I'm fine to make a little cash off of it. Uh, but it is my walk-on song, and I'm not changing. Um, and I feel fine. Um, as far as the other thing, I, I, I you know, I, I like how Dan Dawson talked about that as if it was someone other than Dan Dawson. We all know that it, that was Dan's arm that he asked Andrew Gilding to sign and Dan's going to get the tattoo. He can try to pass it off as some other super fan. But Andrew Gilding only has one true super fan, and that is Dan Dawson. I mean, I love Goldfinger. Obviously, other people do, too. But it's only only Dan Dawson. As far as me getting a darts related tattoo, who's saying I don't already have one? Uh uh, you know, I have about six Mark Walsh tattoos as well as a Mark Walsh themed hoodie. Um, but that's that's a me thing, not an anyone else thing. I, I guess Paul Nicholson probably does as well, um, since uh, Nicholson shares my appreciation of the true goat, Mark Walsh. Uh, but beyond that, I don't think I'd get it. I don't, I'm not going to get a seventh dart related tattoo, at least until Mark Walsh wins the 2025 20, World Seniors. Ah, oh, brilliant. Six Mark Walsh tattoos. Can anyone beat that? Do get in touch if, if you can beat that record. I think that is a, a record you're going to have for some time, Burton. But just starting with the walk-ons, we did joke, uh, would Kevin Painter consider changing his walk-on song of I Predict a Right to what was, well, what is Luke Humphrey's now old walk-on song, Cake by the Ocean, and Kev getting in touch saying, if I changed it, it would be something nobody else already has. So there's Kevin Painter's answer. He's not going to take someone else's walk on and that's fair enough I, I think it's a stance that most people would agree with and you mentioned it there how some players have used other people's walk-ons in the past or, or shared them in some cases we've seen it with Bo Greaves and, and John Henderson both using rocking all over the world I, I think back to uh, the song Ruby which was used by Roby John Rodriguez and Louis Will Williams I think those were the two that used that song but this instance uh, with Luke Humphrey switching to I Predict a Riot seems to have gained a, a lot more publicity and probably understandably too with him being the world number one reigning world champion and, and changing his song during a Premier League season, one of the most recognisable events 
on the calendar and the song I predicted right, it did become synonymous with Kevin Painter during his run in the PDC, still uses it to this day in the, the World Seniors events. But yeah, whilst I like the players to be their own individual, have their own song that's unique to them, I don't mind it too much here because the two players, they are playing, I guess you could say, in, in different spheres right now. You've got Luke at the top of the PDC, Kevin Painter is in the senior, so you're not going to see them play each other on TV anytime soon and there is a a link with the song Leeds United their fans have been singing that song this season Luke Humphreys if you didn't uh, guess it is a a Leeds fan so it made sense to switch it up for that night and uh, as a player you've got to do well you've got to go with something that you like and you feel comfortable walking out to Glenn Durrant who was on the show last week he used to share his walk on with Adrian Lewis whilst he was in the BDO and then when he made that jump to the PDC he swapped his song quite a few times and he said to us he didn't feel the same walking out to different songs so it it can make a difference for players but I think the only walk-on song I would pinch and uh, Peter Wright's already done it in the Premier League this year is Robert Thornton's 500 Miles by the Proclaimers but that's just because I'm a a big Proclaimers fan but Touchwood like you Burton my walk my walk-on song my original pick the farm altogether now hasn't been used yet so got to say big respect to all the players out there for not using it yet and waiting for me to get good at darts so that I do have a reason to have that uh, walk-on song but as for a tattoo not a big tattoo guy I've got to say so it's it's unlikely I would get a tattoo of any kind let alone a a darts related one but if I had to if I had to get a a darts related tattoo I'm not going to get one with Mark Walsh I'm not going to get one with Coast Stompy on I'm going to go with you've probably seen it on Twitter as well the graphic that the Modus Super Series post with their weekly lineup of players when Jamie Robinson get selected I'm going to get that tattooed on my forehead so yeah and that was a joke before the modus matchmakers give Jamie a call you're not going to do a tattoo of the Zulu checkout <laughs> potentially yeah that's that's not a bad shout but there's there's been plenty of them to, to choose from well we'll now go on to our question of the week sponsored by Condor Darts and that is who qualifies for the Premier League playoffs a straight shootout between Nathan Aspinall and Michael Smith Yes, yeah, a, a tough one, and it's close in our poll on Twitter at the moment as well. Nathan Aspinall, 60%, Michael Smith, 40% at the time of recording, so still time to go and have your say on that. A few of our listeners getting in touch. Connor Troy saying Smith, but I hope Aspinall, because it'd be cruel to miss out two years in a row on the last night of regular action. And Jack Spencer saying, I want it to be Asp, but I feel Michael will play some of his brilliant best and put Nathan aside with ease in the end. And yeah, you could say that we're Premier League glory hunters here. We're tuning in for the final week of the regular season and the playoffs next week when the stakes are at their highest. Where were we in week three, week four? We, we weren't watching it, but the third year of this format and for the third year running, that last playoff spot, it does come down to the final week. So in that metric, this new format does guarantee in some ways that there is going to be something to play for in that final league night. We had Joe Cullen edge Peter Wright in 2022. I think he was six out of six on the doubles in that game. Last year, Nathan Aspinall beat Johnny Clayton in that fourth v fifth game, but he needed to win his semi-final as well, get that extra point to go above Johnny Clayton, and he lost out to go in price. So this year, much simpler equation. It does come down to Michael Smith against Nathan Aspinall. The winner goes to the 0-2, the loser. It's going to be at home watching it or they might be joining us and putting Emmerdale on. But these two players get on very well. Only a few weeks ago, they were both in Las Vegas enjoying some downtime. The head-to-head going off of Darts Oracle, very close as well. Michael Smith leading it 11-10. And when you look at the history of these two playing each other, they tend to go in streaks as well. Smith winning the first three meetings. Aspinall, he's won three in a row as well before. Smith's won four in a row. And Aspinall, he'd won three in a row, dating back to the, the World Series last year, the first two Premier League meetings this year. But then last week in Leeds, Michael Smith snapping that streak, won their quarterfinal 6-3 and made sure that it comes down to, to this week, that final game. And who's going to win it? I am leaning towards Nathan Aspinall for this one. I just think right now, when it comes down to a, a one-off game, he's going to have the edge. And the commentators, they'll often say that Nathan Aspinall, he's a, he's a fighter. He's a tenacious character on the hockey end. He'll probably feel like he should have got the job done already, the playoffs. It should have been wrapped up. He's lost a couple of deciders to Luke Littler in, in recent weeks. Then last week, he lost to Michael Smith, despite averaging 99. So we've, as far as Michael Smith, we've not seen the best of him in the Premier League. But a bit like Nathan Aspinall, he showed some fighting qualities last week, getting that win against him to take it to the final week. He's been fifth for a while now he's kept in touch and now he's got that chance to sneak in at the last minute to the playoffs but I think he's going to come up short Nathan Aspinall he's going to produce the goods get over the line and 
after playing in the playoffs in 2020 behind closed doors, that small crowd in Milton Keynes 2021, it's going to be his third playoff campaign, but it's going to be the first in front of that big crowd at the I2. So uh, another big milestone for the Asp next week. And now we'll move on to our second guest. No, no, I guess <laughs> I'll, I'll answer this question. Um, I, I've been saying all year that when it got down to the final week before the playoffs, I'll pay attention. So it's only fair that I pretend like I care and answer this question. Um, I, I just don't know. I haven't watched enough Premier League to know. And I, I'm so like I, I know I'm be, I'm beating a horse that has already been buried. It's been dead for so long. But this Premier League format just doesn't do it for me. It was, you know, it was good. It was fine the first year, but it got old last year. And even now, when it comes down to a match that decides who goes to the playoffs, and I will watch the playoffs. You know, that's always good darts. It's it's worth watching. I just can't care because they played each other so much. And, uh, you know, I should have a coin around here. Hopefully I do so I can make my pick. I'm just going to flip a coin. But I don't have a coin. So I'll flip a darts flight, a packet of flights. If I can see the flights, uh, then it'll be Nathan Aspinall. If it goes the other side so you don't see the flights, it's going to be uh, Michael Smith. So who's it going to be? Nathan Aspinall. Uh, the target flights don't lie. Nathan Aspinall wins it, and I'll say by six legs to four. There we go. That is the dynamite darts content you guys have, have come to expect on this show. And before we bring in our, our next guest, you'll have seen on our social media this week that we've got a new sponsor on board in, in Quiff. So before we bring in our last guest, let's hand you over to Jack from Quiff to find out a bit more about them. Quiff are proud to announce a partnership with the Weekly Darts Cast. have been the flagship sponsor of, in my opinion, one of the best uh, darts podcasts out there. The two boys do a brilliant show. He starts with this Thursday's renewal. You'll see Quiff and that purple logo plaster everywhere. We'll start by looking at the Premier League Week 16, end of next week's final the O2. I presented that trophy five years ago. I actually had hair then. Um, we'll look forward then to the Ben Thick to sponsor World Cup of Dance is the Bet Fred World match play in Blackpool in July. And then going forward, we'll still be hopefully sticking around for the uh, Grand Slam of Dance in Wolverhampton. The WDF Lakeside sponsored by Quiff World Championships, formerly the BDO, and then finally the BDC World Dance Championships at the, at the Alexandra Palace. But it all starts this week. Quiff sponsoring the weekly dance cast and me, Jack Milner, hopefully on for a few cameos. Thanks to Jack and all the team at Quiff. Great to have them on board. More on them at the end of the show. But let's bring in our final guest on this week's show. He is the 40 to 1 outsider that won the Modus Super Series last week. Here's our chat with Andy Davidson. I'm pleased to say we're joined by the winner of last week's Modus Super Series, Andy Davidson. Thanks for the time, Andy. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing very well. It's still, it's still not sunk in what I've achieved. But yeah, it, it's still incredible for me. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. We're talking only a few days on from the finals night on Saturday where you won the title to qualify for Champions Week. Six consecutive days of darts for you ends with you lifting that trophy. What have the last few days been like since winning that? Yeah, well, Sunday was just crazy. The amount of messages and from from, uh, from folk from everywhere has just been unbelievable. And it's only really sort of yesterday that it sort of, you know, I've got a bit back to reality. It's just been... <laughs> It's just been crazy. Has the phone stopped going off yet with messages of congratulations? Have you managed to get back to everyone? Yeah, I've, I've tried my best. I really have. But, uh, I hope I have got back to everybody. But uh, yeah, it just it's just been yeah the amount of messages of support I've had. It's uh, it's been it's been really nice to see. Well, you went into last week's Super Series. It was your debut as one of the ADC qualifiers, a, a relative unknown to a lot of darts fans. Some places they're pricing you as 33 to 1, even 40 to 1 to win the week. So what were your own expectations at the start of the week because you were playing in that Group A on the, the Monday morning? It was just to play well and to do myself justice, to be quite honest. You know, um, I didn't have any expectations to make the finals night, really, because obviously with making my debut... It was just to get used to the stage and, uh, you know, sort of grow into the week as it went on. But, yeah, to to go all the way, I still I still can't quite believe I've done that. 
Well, we'll come back to last week a, a bit later on, but for many Darts fans, it was the first time they'll have seen you play. You're 28, you're from Edinburgh, but let's circle back to the beginning for you in Darts. Where did it all begin and how old were you when you first discovered the game? Yeah, so I was I was 15 when I first got a dartboard. I was always fascinated by watching uh, the, the lake side, the likes of Martin Adams, uh, Tony O'Shea, all those kind of guys. Uh, and I just sort of started throwing in my throwing in a board in my room and then when I could eventually get into the pubs when I turned 18 um, yeah I just had to go at a few local tournaments and the very first tournament I entered obviously I didn't know anybody in the room apart from when I saw Gary Stone walk in the room when he was playing at Lakeside around about 2012-2013 and it ended up losing to him in the final that day and I thought wow this is this could be the start of something and uh, yeah you know, 10 years later, um, yeah, lifting that title on Sunday is incredible. Well, I was looking back at some of your previous results as well. You started playing on the development tour in 2015, around the age of 18 or, or 19. What was that first taste of the PDC setup like back then? Yeah, it was, again, I was just going in with no expectations really, again, just to try and uh, enjoy the experience. Uh, but yeah, the professional setup that they have down there is, uh, yeah second to none and yeah it was it was quite an experience you know because my first time at development tour I ended up playing Adam Hunt and uh, Matthew Dennant who, who both at the time had tour cards so it was uh, yeah quite an eye-opener <laughs> but uh, yeah it was good to good to get the experience uh, down there which was uh, yeah brilliant. And you've also played a, a few times at the UK Open, the first couple of times, 2016, 2017, as one of the Riley's qualifiers, and the, the first of those picking up a, a few wins as well, making it to that Friday night, the last 64. What are your memories of that weekend? Yeah, that was, again, I was just going in without thinking, you know, if I could do well again. It was just experience playing in front of a massive crowd in Minehead uh, on the on the backboards there. But, yeah, to beat... Um, Jan Decker and Crystal Reyes was uh, was brilliant and I didn't play quite so well in the game I lost to Darren Webster but again I, I always looked at the positive side of it the fact I got that far on my debut in the UK Open was, uh, was a tremendous achievement and then to qualify again the next two years unfortunately the last year I couldn't play with uh, that being the year of the uh, all the snow but uh, you know it was a good experience the three times I played in it yeah, I was going to say, you did the hat-trick of the Riley's qualifiers. You won it again in 2018, but as you mentioned there, unfortunately, Storm Emma, as it was, forcing several players to withdraw from the event. What do you remember about that? Yeah, that was that was pretty insane, because we were trying to even just get as far as uh, the likes of Newcastle and then potentially to uh, get a drive down to even have a half chance of making it, but it, it, the, the conditions were just... Yeah, they were just, it was just impossible. You know, we were fighting a losing battle, unfortunately. So whilst it was frustrating at the time, unfortunately, there's nothing you could do about it. So you just have to park it and move on. Well, you did get back to Minehead in 2020, this time as one of the high ranked players from the development tour. And that was off the back of some great results on that circuit, including two finals. What did those runs mean to you at the time? Yeah, I get. Yeah, I felt I played pretty well in uh, the development tour in 2019. Um, yeah, those two finals, unfortunately, I, I didn't quite quite find it against Ted Everts and uh, Ryan Meikle. I think it might have been uh, in the other final. But uh, yeah, I produced some pretty solid performances at times. But uh, yeah, it was it was good to uh, good to end. That was my last year in development tour as well. So it was uh, good to end on a on a high on that on that risk on that regard. And just before that UK Open 2020, you did make a, a first visit to Q School. What was that experience like, and did it give you a, a clearer picture of where your game needed to be to get on the tour? Uh, yeah, potentially. I mean, at the time, I'd just signed with um, Don Vegan and Tommy Gilmore. I'd signed for them in, uh, I think it was about June 2019. Uh, so, but at the time, I was, I was going through a lot of health issues. Uh, I have a condition... Uh, in my jawline, which essentially, um, essentially is a sen you know like getting shocks down your face, which is just uh, which is just brutal. And during that Q school in 2020, it was probably up there with with the worst it could be. But I didn't. I, I felt I had to go because I didn't want to let Tommy down. Essentially, uh, but yeah, that's why 
of my performances on that particular uh, Q school were uh, not were not terribly good. No, that makes sense. And for for the next few years, obviously, uh, quite a long period of that time, we had the the pandemic, which put a stop to a a lot of darts. But for you, did you take any time away from the game, or were you still playing at a, a local level when we didn't see your name crop up in those PDC events? Yeah, I mean, I, throughout, throughout sort of most of 2021 and 2022, as I say, my health, to be honest, pretty much dominated uh, uh, my sort of darting pathway, if you like, because I, I, I'd sort of had sort of spells, but it was nothing nothing to really properly write home about. And I was more concerned about getting myself right rather than how my darts went. And uh, eventually I got that sorted at sort of, you know, maybe about the middle of this year, or last year, sorry. And uh, yeah, since then, you know, to be able to play pain free again, because it's it's been a while since I've really felt like that. Uh, so it's it's just great in that respect. Definitely, no. Glad to hear that you're you're pain free and, and playing now. And you did have a, a go at Q school last year, and unfortunately you had to pull out after that first day with an illness. Was that one of the the low points for you in darts? Was that a, a big setback for you, thinking if if I can't sort this illness out, I'm, I'm not going to be able to maybe fulfil my potential in the game? Yeah, hundred percent. Because it it was only really about maybe seven eight months ago that I was actually questioning whether I was actually going to play at all to continue going forward because as you said my head my health was just uh, dominating my life really and you know it's, I, I just felt there was never going to be a stage where it was going to be a hundred percent all we'd be thinking was well okay I might be being free but how long till it returns again and I've had um, you know I've had psychological treatment uh, to try and get me thinking positively rather than you know, rather than thinking, is it going to return? I'm more thinking, like, well, be thankful you're pain free. And uh, I think I've almost took those positive aspects into into last week. I feel because at no point did I start beating myself up or doubting myself. So uh, yeah, I think it's really uh, really helped me. No, glad to hear it. And the, the final months of 2023, you're starting to make a name for yourself on the ADC circuit. What would a, a typical week look like for you, darts wise? How often would you get out to play? Is it just tournaments, leagues, or a mixture of both? Yeah, it's, it's a bit of a mixture of both. Yeah, but I tend to I tend to stick to uh, the vault events. Uh, you know, on a, on a Sunday at my local pub, the um, the ship in, and then occasionally I go through to um, the Coburn Sports Bar in uh, in Up Hall and uh, the players lounge in Falkirk uh, on a Tuesday and Wednesday night. Uh, again, the vault series where you're playing your five group games and then a knockout from there. And some of the guys that you're playing against, Stephen Johnson, Greg Ritchie, David Sharp, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a right tough standard, so you have to be on it from, from, the, from, very, from very early in the day. And it's through the ADC as well, you get the spot in the Modus Super Series. Can you talk us through that route that you went down to qualify? I'm, I'm led to believe it was the performances you had in the vault got you a, a spot in the regional finals in Scotland and then winning that, that got you the, the place in the Super Series. Yeah, so it was just it was the finals day of, um, of Vault 7 in the Players' Lounge in Falkirk. I was, I was fortunate enough to get in the top 32 and then I was playing really well. Up till the up till the semi finals, uh, and I almost blew a five one lead, just scraped over the line six five, uh, and then in the final I ended up playing uh, Martin Atkins, and yeah, again I think I missed several darts to win five three, and then he missed a dart to go I think five all in the final, and I managed to take out one hundred six to get there, uh, which yeah was just you know it was just that was just an incredible achievement for me in itself. To even qualify for the Modus Super Series, let alone go ahead and do what do what I've done. Yeah, let's get on to what you've done last week then, because there was a, a few highlights even before Saturday night's finals. You had that win over Ashley Coleman, five minutes fifty eight seconds. You had the one ten average against Scott Taylor. You beat some established names, the likes of Devin Peterson, Trina Gulliver as well during that week. But for you, what moment sticks out the most? I have to say it must be the 110 average that I had against Scott Taylor because as I felt in my first group game uh, against Aidan Kirk that night, I just couldn't hit a double in that match, but it was the best I felt on stage and I still felt my scoring was was, was there, so I knew I was going to give myself chances against uh, Scott, 
even though he was playing really well that night. But yeah, to to fire in a hundred and ten average against him was just yeah beyond anything I could ever expect. But for me to back it up with the uh, the next game against Ashley Coleman with a hundred and four average meant a bit more as well. The fact that it wasn't just a one off fluky game that you know that I actually do have a game in me and given me a bit of self belief which I probably have lacked in the past. So yeah, the whole week is yeah made me made me believe I can do it. Yeah, we could see that the confidence was growing. You top Group B, seven wins from the eight games to get to the finals night, and you win four out of four on that finals night to win the week. Uh, the 98 average against Tommy Morris in the semi-finals, and then there's that nervy decider in the final with Aidan Kirk. You both miss match darts. How tense were those last few minutes of that final? Yeah, oh, very much so. But I felt, I felt well. Aidan should have really beat me four two because uh, he missed two darts to he missed two darts to win four two. So I didn't actually feel that bad at the start of the deciding leg, but as soon as it came down to, I think it was 35 was my first shot to win the title, that's when that's when the nerves really took over and you're throwing more in hope than expectation. And as I was lining up that double four, all I was thinking was, just put a good, just put a good throw on it. If it doesn't go in, unlucky, fair play to Aiden. But yeah, yeah and as you saw from the reaction, it was just more disbelief that I'd actually managed to do it. Yeah, we, we saw your reaction after the final. You you were shocked that you'd won the week. Five grand for winning the week. And next week, you're going to be back for Champions Week where there's going to be 25 grand up for grabs for the winner. So how excited are you to have a, a go at that next week? Yeah, it's it's it's, ha- it's handy that it's, uh, you know, it's only next week. So I don't really have the chance to sort of come down. Um, you know, I'm back on the road again on Sunday. So I'm playing against, again, some unbelievable players uh you know, starting in Group A again uh, for me. So I'll be playing at least Monday to Friday and hopefully Saturday as well. And yeah, again, I'm just going to treat it exactly how I did last week. Just not going to expect anything and just, again, see how they go. And if they go well, you never know. Could be lifting the trophy again. Definitely. Well, you've just had a week in Portsmouth playing the Super Series. You're back there next week. But what does this week in between look like? Is it back to work? Are you juggling full-time work with this sudden added involvement with the darts? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, Royal Mail have been tremendous with me. Uh, you know, I had to had to go in on Monday and explain I'm probably going to need more time off in the future, which they are, ha- they are happy to give me because, you know, I'm going down representing, uh, representing my country. So... Uh, yeah, they're, they've been really supportive of me and uh, giving me a bit more flexibility with uh, getting time off when I need it, which is, uh, which is fantastic. Excellent. And, and looking further ahead on, on stage on Saturday night, you said you weren't thinking of Q School for 2025, but you might have to now. But before we get there, what's the plan darts-wise for the rest of this year? You've got Champions Week next week, but have you got anything else in the diary darts-wise? Yeah, I do. I've got. Um, well, I've, I've been invited back for um, Series Eight on the Moda Super Series, so I'm playing Week Four of that on the 24th of uh, June. I'm playing from Group A again, which is which is fabulous. Um, I'll be doing the Welsh Open, I think. I'll be doing Bridlington uh, for the British Open. Uh, that's all I've got so far. Uh, and you know, if I get another chance to potentially do Champions Week again at the Modus, that would be. That would be another week that I could potentially have. So that's that's my schedule at the moment. And that dream of, of Q School winning a, a tour card, a, a lot of players want to get on the tour, make enough money to turn pro. Is that a dream which now seems more realistic after last week, or are you still just taking it as you find, not getting too carried away with it? Yeah, I'm just I'm not getting too carried away at the moment. I mean, it's it's one good week, but uh, you know, got to got to back up now. You know, I've got a I've got a very important week next week. Uh, but I'm just enjoying it. I'm just, I'm just enjoying it. I'm not going to think, you know, about getting a tour card yet. You know, it's. I'm just taking everything in my stride, game by game, and see how they go. Yeah, we always tell people to enjoy the darts. Andy, it's great to get you on the show. Thanks very much for giving us some of your time, and congratulations again on on last week. And we wish you all the best for Champions Week next week, and what else is to come in 2024 as well. Thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate your time. Thanks again to Andy for joining us and we'll finish up the show with the mailbag. Three questions to answer before we go. And the first one coming from the artist formerly known as Richard. Bit of an odd one, but what do you lads make of the new pre-final 
Euro Tour routine the streams present. They used to let us experience the in-venue DJ belting out the Beatles, Robbie Williams and Phil Collins, but now it's a best of Euro Tour clip show type thing. Yeah, and I think one thing to note is that now in some countries, the Euro Tour is on uh, television. So the coverage over the last couple of years um, has been uh, changed to be more of a television setup, um, which is why you'll see when it goes uh, to an advert break, uh, at least I mean, we don't see the adverts on the stream, but it you know you see the clock saying it's three minutes and you have a few of those scheduled in uh, between the semifinal and the final. And you see a little bit more presenting from uh, Dan Dawson or when he's not there, someone at the start of the session and at certain times, um, as well as the commentary leading into matches. And as to make it more of a television-like um, set up uh, for the countries where it is broadcast on television. Now, I, I, I've not been in Switzerland for one of these events. I assume they have their own German language people for television, but having all that um, set up and that timing added in makes it easier for you just to dub over some commentary um, into uh, the German language. But I, I I liked the old setup. I liked being able to hear the songs in between matches, um, including, of course, the German rendition of Take Me Home Country Road. But I understand this change. It, it's meant for television. Um, and I'm sure that, that PDC Europe is trying to get other countries to put this on television. So having what is more of a television broadcast than just an online stream is the right call. Yeah, we lose out on something, but if we want to get that, we can always fly to one of these events. I know it's expensive. I know it takes time. It's worth doing if you can make it work, even if you can only go to one. If not, then you just have to accept that the PDC and PDC Europe are trying to monetize this, um, which is good for the sport. It's good for the players, and it's good for the growth of the European Tour. So I don't have a problem with it, even if we lose a little bit of that intimacy. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. And uh, yeah, one of the points you made there at the end about going to these Euro Tour events, that's uh, another incentive to get out there to Germany, Switzerland, Czech Republic, wherever it is, to experience that build up to a Euro Tour final and hear these songs played in the venue. Because, as you know, the production value of these Euro Tours is stepped up. And back in the old days, in between games, it would just be that graphic of the order of play, the results so far, the games coming up, you'd hear as you say, that the songs that were being played in the arena. And that's how we've come to hear that iconic build-up to these Euro Tour finals. Sunday nights, Phil Collins in the air tonight, a bit of Robbie Williams Angels in there as well, which not a shame to admit, I'm a, a fan of that as well. But with the broadcast now, we get a, a few best of clips thrown in there. I look back at the previous year's final of that tournament, which I, I guess adds to the show. But at the same time, I do think we miss that build-up with the songs that get the crowd going and I always thought that it reminded me of, it's funny that I say this because we have got Rod Studd on the show this week but it did remind me a, a little bit of the boxing because you'd have that long build up to the main event you'd hear Sweet Caroline pumping around the venue the crowd singing along and yeah I used to like that we get to see that ourselves watching at home you felt closer to the action you got more of a, a flavour of what the atmosphere is like so yeah for me it's a shame we don't get that anymore maybe it's something we could see come back in the future talk about the production values dan dawson doing a little bit of presenting at the start of the show imagine if this euro tour broadcast they start doing some more of that you do some pieces on the stage or just off stage with a presenter and commentators looking ahead to the final then you would get that background noise at home and you would hear those songs again so perhaps that's something to look at further down the line and could be a way for us fans at home to experience that pre-final build-up from the venue again now, two more questions about two players that over the first 355 episodes we've talked quite a bit about, but maybe just a little bit less this year. The first one of those two comes from Darts Deisinger, who says it's been still a long while until then. But if he wasn't to win a big title this season and to drop out of the top four after the World Championships, do you think Gerwin Price would still be included in next year's Premier League? Yeah, it's a good question. And this year, Gerwin Price, he started the year in fifth so he was outside that top four he was reliant on a wild card from the pdc to get in the premier league which he got and you look at his 2023 got to the final of the world grand prix got to the final with the premier league and if you count the world cup as a major which we do in homage to the goat coast on pay he won that with johnny clayton but 
ended the season, early exits in the Grand Slam, Players' Championship finals, the Worlds as well. But I think being fifth in the world, topping the league phase of the Premier League, making the final, another one at the Grand Prix I mentioned, that was more than enough credit in the bank for going Price to get into that Premier League this year. But if we're looking at his bid for next year's Premier League already, well, he's got some more work to do, hasn't he? Because he's not going to make the playoffs. He's going to finish seventh, possibly sixth, if results go his way and he wins the night. But looking further ahead to that post-World Championship order merit, again, still very early days, but he's in fourth at the moment. But the gap between him and Dave Chisnell in, in seventh, only 14 and a half grand. So not a lot between them. And you've also got Nathan Aspinall, and Damon Hare between them as well. So I would be very surprised if Gerwin Price is not in the Premier League next year. I think he's still a big name player in the game, still playing to a, a high standard most weeks. He had that nine data in Manchester a few weeks ago as well. So I think it would take him being out the top four and maybe four other players outside that top four winning majors, outperforming him consistently in the majors between now and the end of season for him to miss out. Yeah, I, I see... It, a likelihood he'll be back in next year, even if it stays at eight players. Um, and I originally had him on my list of people to mention back on the second question of who's impressed me so far this year on the Euro Tour. But I, but being that we were going to come around to talk about him, I didn't mention him then. But so far this year, he's only played for the Euro Tours. He's averaged over 108 of his 15 matches. And in those four Euro Tours, he's at two semifinals and a final Uh and he still made it to Sunday in the other one. So he's playing phenomenally. And we've talked about like the high averages he's had in the Premier League um, so far this year, um, even if, like Rob Cross, he hasn't been able to get results. Uh, but I do think he needs to do something. You know, six years in a row now, uh, Gurren Price has won a Euro Tour event. He's certainly in the conversation right now, but he hasn't won one yet this year. And in fact, you know, you go back the last four years, he won one. Of, he won at one of the first two. Um, so we're a lot further along in the year without him having won yet. But I just think he's going to do something this year. Yeah, if he doesn't win anything. Yeah, if he slides down the rankings, that might change something. And that is what the question is saying. If he doesn't win something big. Um but I still think he's going to win a Euro Tour at some point this year. I still think he's going to, even if he doesn't win a major, make a few deep runs. He's playing at too high of a standard not to. So I think even if he doesn't win a title, he's still going to do enough in the second half of the year to be a surefire bet to get back into the Premier League next season. Um, because, well, I, I don't see eight players who are going to be doing more than him over the rest of the year. And our final question from the mailbag comes from a friend of the show, John Thompson, who says, looking just at the numbers over the last half year or so, I'm not sure if MVG is currently a top five player in the world. Is that a legit argument or am I insane? Well, having uh, seen many of uh, John Thompson's tweets over the years back when I was on Twitter, um, I think I can say that he has a lot of legit arguments, but that also doesn't mean that he's not insane. Uh, no, I, I, I kid. Uh, I mean, I think it's a legit argument. I don't, I don't think I agree with it, but I think there's definitely a legit argument there. And you know, if you look at how often MBG averages over a hundred, um, it's gone completely downhill over the last six years, and it, it did steady. You know, it was a slope. It peaked with a period where he was doing 65 to 70 percent, sometimes a little over 70 percent of the time averaging over 100 before it dropped off after into the pandemic down into the 40s. But it's steadied there. And this year, though, it's gone down a further six, seven points. Um, and I think there is a huge inconsistency in his game. And even more than that, um, there's no longer the invincibility factor. And there's a question about his bottle in tight matches. He's not the player that once won 19 consecutive last leg deciders on a European tour. The type of the player who, if you gave him a chance to win the match, he was going to win the match. And there wasn't anything else to debate on that. Now, even if you give him a chance, there's no guarantee he's going to take it. And if you give him a second chance, there's no guarantee he's going to take that either. And that's the thing. There's a vulnerability about him. I still think in overall talent and overall ability and overall performance, he's one of the five best players in the world. I, I think he's actually still probably the third, maybe fourth best player in the world right now. But there's a vulnerability and an inconsistency um, and a and a genuine general 
lack of confidence that we've never seen from him before. And it makes him more vulnerable and it makes them there be every chance that he's not going to be top five in results. So I think it's a legit argument. I don't think that at least for this one, John, you're insane. Uh, but I don't think I agree. I do think he's top five. I think he's actually top three. But again, it is legit. Yeah, I think that's fair. And I'll come on to that top five in a moment. But I think back to 2020, the Premier League, where Michael Van Gogh missed out on the playoffs. He finished sixth. And the handicappers nightmare is a tag that you gave to Daryl Gurney. And we were saying, is MVG the new handicappers nightmare? Because we, we just didn't know what we were going to get from him. And that still stands somewhat because he is hard to predict. He can throw a 110 average one night against Luke Littler, lose the game, and then another night get to a final lose with a 92 average and, and have a dart to win the night so that's just the Premier League in the last couple of months and again the Premier League he's, he's won the last two years the playoffs but you look at his performances over a, a longer period of time and this is going off the last three years since we've had this new format and looking at an average of just below 94 which says that you finished the leg in 16 darts or more so six visits or more to the board and this year 27 games played 17 of them, he's averaged above that 93.94 to be exact, 10 times he hasn't. And the previous year, 30 of his 33 games, he averaged higher than that. So that shows you that the the, uh, the levels have dipped quite a bit for him in the, the last year or so. And he, even though I say that, he's won four nights in the Premier League this year. The previous couple of years, he's won three of the nights. So he, he's done better in that respect, but still going into this week, third in the table, could finish fourth potentially. So he's going to be in the playoffs again, but further away from the, the top spot than he's ever been. He's someone that used to finish top all the time. 2022, he finished second. He was nine points off top. Last year, finished third, six points off top. This year, as I say, 11 points off going into that final week of the season. And in terms of the gap to fifth place, that's something that we've seen shorten as well in the last few years. The last couple of years, it's been nine points. This year, going into that final night, three points so again shows you that the gap is closing in the, in the other side of it as well but I think with Michael Van Gogh and if you're calling the top five over the last six months yeah I think you would put him in I think you've got Littler and Humphreys there shoe-ins Rob Cross as well Gary Anderson we, we've seen more of him this year he's, he's averaging more than anyone else then it gets a little bit tricky would you have Nathan Aspinall in there would you have Stephen Bunting in there so I, I think we have got a, a definite top two in the, in the two Luke's after that it does get a little bit tricky, but MVG, yeah, I think he gets in that top five. But the fact that we are discussing if he's in it says a lot, doesn't it? Because he used to be number one. And now it's uh, and now it's we're talking about if he's in that top five. So it just shows you how much the, the darting landscape has changed. Well, there's one thing that hasn't changed in the darting landscape, and that's me saying this. Anything else for this week? No, thankfully that hasn't changed. Well, we've got to say a big thank you to our guests for joining us, to Rod. And Andy, for their time, thank you to our sponsors, to Darts Corner, Condor Darts, for their support. Links in the description. Do go and check them out for your darting needs. And a a big thank you as well to our newest sponsor, Quiff. Great to have them on board with us and lots of exciting stuff planned with them over the coming months. So do keep an eye on our social media. Keep listening to the show. And if you do fancy a flutter on the darts, open an account with Quiff. You can go on their website. You can do it via their app. Links in the description. You can supercharge your bets with Quiff. You've got a chance to get then boosted to a higher price. And we have to remind you, 18 plus terms and conditions apply. BeGambleAware.org, please gamble responsibly. And just lastly, big thank you to everyone for listening. We appreciate the support. We'll be back next week. We'll have a look ahead to the Premier League playoffs. We'll see if our picks are right. Did Nathan Aspinall get in or is it Michael Smith joining Luke Little, Luke Humphreys and Michael Van Gogh at the OD2? And there's only one way to find out, only one way of doing that, and that is to enjoy the darts. But you got to hang tight until those darts come about. Um, So that's what I'll leave you guys with. Just another reminder to do all your hanging tight now, because there'll be a lot of darts to enjoy over the next couple months. And well, hang tight until then.